Hey guys, so you got the DCS FA-18 Hornet. You immediately put yourself on a carrier, it went full burner, shot off the end of the boat. America, fuck yeah. After flying about doing what I can only imagine professional pilots do, you realized you were bingo fuel. Now you had two options. Option one, eject. Oh, what a loser. Or Put that fucker back on the deck like a boss ass bitch. Now, you went and tried to put it back on the deck, didn't you? And it probably went something like this. No! Oh. No! Oh. No! Oh. Or maybe this. No, 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 no! Or maybe even this. Please, no! 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 So let's talk about case one recovery. First, what does case one mean? Case one occurs when flights are anticipated to not encounter instrument conditions or IMC during daytime recoveries. The ceiling and visibility around the carrier are no lower than 3000 feet and five nautical miles. Now I'm sure some of you have seen this diagram for a case one recovery pattern, and we'll get to that step by step in a minute. To preface for those of you that are new to this kind of thing, let me go over some basics real quick. First, let's talk about angle of attack or AOA. The textbook definition for angle of attack is as follows. The difference between the cord, which is the middle of the front to the middle of the back of the wing, and the direction of the relative wind. Now, I'm sure you could talk way more in depth about this, but I'm just going to brush over what it is and how we'll use it for this demonstration. Basically, you can think of it as the pitch angle of the wings relative to the direction we are flying, to maintain velocity along a specific vector. The way this is referenced for the Hornet for carrier recovery is known as on speed. I know, I know, some of you are probably thinking, wait, I don't understand. Well, let me explain. The landing speed in a plane is based on your weight. In civilian aviation, this is generally much more of a constant than in military. In military aviation, you have different fuel states and weapon loadouts to account for. For instance, landing with 3,000 pounds of fuel compared to 15,000 pounds of fuel is an entire elephant's worth of fuel in weight. A fully loaded Hornet at takeoff would weigh about 51,900 pounds. While landing, it could be as low as 25,000 pounds, which is equivalent to shedding over, let's say, 13,000 barbecue chickens, or 4,500 smoked pork shoulders, or 3,000 smoked briskets. I'm getting hungry. What the increased weight does is increase the required lift to maintain your altitude or descent rate. You have two options here, increase your speed or increase your AOA. Since AOA is important in Navy aircraft due to the relationship between the tail hook and the main gear, the airspeed must be increased in order to maintain the required lift. And you know, this is pretty obvious since you know, the formula is lift equals the coefficient of lift times density times velocity squared divided by two times wing area. You guys get it. Airliners in the civilian world do this as well. But instead of reading out the AOA and flying that, they simply plug and chug in their FMS and it will spit out the approach speed for them. Now I know what you're thinking. Math jabbers? Really? If you don't understand it, it's not that big a deal. Just remember that you have to do zero math with AOA. Sorry, that joke might have been a bit too soon for some of you. Trust me, you'll understand that in a minute. Now, military pilots do have to calculate on-speed airspeed in real life in case of failure, but you can leave that to the professionals. However, if you really want to know, here's the formula. Moving on. For our landing in the Hornet, we will not be referencing the speed once we put out our landing gear and flaps. Instead, we will be referencing this. This is known as the AOA indexer. It has five different light configurations that tell us five useful things while landing our plane. We have slow, which is anywhere from 9.3 degrees to 90 degrees of AOA. We have slightly slow, which is 8.8 .8 to 9.3 degrees of AOA. We have on speed, 7.4 to 8.8 .8 degrees. Slightly fast, 6.9 to 7.4. And fast, which is anywhere from 0 to 6.9. With these five configurations, we can judge what we need to do to get back to our on-speed AOA and completely ignore what our current airspeed is. The reason we want to be on speed is this is the proper AOA that will achieve the correct hook angle to catch our target wire on the carrier. So let's just quickly cover an example of what it looks like, how we get there, and how you recover if you're too slow. To start, we're about 200 knots, flaps out, and gear down. You notice that the red carrot is lit indicating that we are too fast, that we need to cut power. In doing this, 
the nose will drop. So we will need to use trim and pitch to keep ourselves level. It's important to be gentle when doing this because you will be at a very low speed and you don't want to be yanking the stick all over the place or you might stall. So you can see now we see the orange donut. This means that we're at our landing speed because we are on the right angle of attack about 8.1 degrees. We can maintain level flight with our current power setting and we can maintain this for as long as we have fuel. Now what happens if we move the stick at all? You can see if I pitch forward, the AOA indexer shows I'm fast. And if I pitch up, it shows I'm slow. And that's because the pitch is changing our speed. So how do we change our velocity vector to increase our vertical velocity? We use our throttle. If I increase the throttle, you can see the velocity vector moves up. And if I decrease it, it moves down. Obviously, you only want to make minor adjustments or you'll sink too fast and you'll not be able to recover. But this style of flying is called pitch for speed, power for altitude. Now, you remember this joke? Zero math. Is it funny now? Still no? All right, sorry. Okay. Now that we have that really important understanding out of the way, let's take a look at the procedure for doing a case one landing. So to get in our position to do the recovery, we wanna first know where it is. And to know where it is, we need to know where the boat is. To figure this out, we need to turn our attack end for the boat and set the course heading. First, we turn on our attack end on the UFC by pressing TCN. Then press on off to turn on the attack end. You wanna double check that you're in transmit receive so we get both bearing and range. Hit clear to ensure we don't have anything left over from prior input, type the tack hand frequency, in this case, 55. Ensure that we are on X-ray and press enter. Now you can see on the HSI that the tack hand frequency worked. We can see the boat, we can see the range and the heading to it. Now we need our BRC or base recovery course. This is the course at which the boat is traveling, not the offset to the angled deck. First, we want to box tack in on the HSI by pressing OSB 20. Next, we press and hold the course or CRS switch for approximately one to two seconds until you see CSEL or CECL on the UFC appear. On the UFC, hit clear and type in the course of the boat. In this case, 353 and hit enter. Now we can see the course radial on the HSI along with the boat location in reference to us and the direction is setting. So with this information, we can move into the holding pattern, which basically looks like this. Oh, no, wait, sorry, wrong holding pattern. It's this one. The holding pattern is defined as a left hand circle tangent to the ship's course with the ship at the three o'clock position and a maximum diameter of five nautical miles. Minimum holding altitude is 2000 feet with a minimum of 1000 foot vertical separation between holding altitudes. Now to save time, I'm not going to actually demonstrate this. We'll save that for another day. So let's move on to the actual carrier break and recovery. Remember this from the beginning of the video? Well, let's get into it. Now, as I go through this, I'll be pausing and discussing because it's gonna happen real quick and there's a lot of things I wanna point out and cover, so bear with me. When I'm done, I'll go ahead and let the whole thing play through without pauses so you can see what it looks like. Whether you are coming direct, which is the way I expect most people in DCS to go, or you're entering from the pattern, you want to place yourself in line with the carrier on BRC about 3.6 nautical miles behind the ship. You want to line yourself up just offset to the right of the ship. So during the upwind pass, you can look down and ensure that the deck is clear and ready for your approach. First, you can see that we are on BRC approximately six nautical miles behind the ship. We're at 800 feet AGL, 350 knots. First, we're going to extend our hook, set rat out to 370 feet. We're going to check that anti-skid is off hook bypass on carrier. We're going to turn on our rat alt. We're going to set the HSI zoom to 10 nautical miles. And during the next four miles is where you're going to want to put your game face on. Give yourself a little pep talk. Mine usually went something like this. I got this. Just forget about the previous 532 failed attempts. About the fact that this will be watched and ridiculed by both real and armchair pilots from around the world. And forget about the fact that I suck. And even if I pull this off, someone will likely point out that I suck. Now, in all seriousness, perfecting this really is difficult. So I suggest you use this five miles to try and visualize what you're going to do and reflect on the mistakes you've previously made and how you're going to correct them. As you pass the ship, you're going to look down and ensure that the deck is clear and ready for your arrival.
Now, for training purposes, we're going to break at 1.5 nautical miles off the bow of the ship. This will give us time to perform our downwind checklist. You want to be able to shorten this in, over time and practice, ideally down to about one nautical mile. In our break, we're going to look for a G of 1% of our current speed, which is about 3.5 Gs. And we're going to hold that halfway through the break using our speed break as necessary. You want to try to achieve 250 knots by the midpoint of the break. In the break, you can judge when you're getting to the midpoint by watching the TACAN information on the HUD. Now, during the break, there's four things that I'm referencing. My bearing relative to BRC, how many Gs I'm pulling, the velocity vector to ensure that my turn is level, and my speed. At some point during this, you're gonna hit 250 knots. As soon as you do, gear down, flaps to full. Now this next part takes practice, but you want to adjust the pull through the midpoint so that you end up roughly 1.1 to 1.3 nautical miles away from the ship on your downwind. A good reference for this is on your HSI, your plane icon, left wingtip, will be touching the BRC line. Once you roll out downwind, start a descent to 600 feet AGL and continue adjusting your on-speed AOA. Now, at this point, I'm referencing three things. The E bracket to help gauge my AOA, the AOA indexer for on-speed, and my altitude descent rate down to 600 feet. I'm also no longer referencing speed. I also want to point out that the E bracket is a more precise way of measuring your AOA. In this shot, you can see that the velocity vector is just under the middle horizontal line in the E putting your AOA right at 8.1, which is the number we want for our landing. Now, I can count on one hand how many times I've willingly not used the E-bracket for AOA control. Next, you'll want to go ahead and cage your HUD. This will allow your HUD to not be adjusted for wind conditions, keeping the symbology much more easily in view. Your next sight picture is a beam to the boat. You should be at 600 feet AGL and hopefully on speed we're going to hold 600 feet AGL until we start our approach turn. The approach turn starts when you see the white of the round down. The round down is the aftmost part of the ship and slopes down to a 45 degree angle. Because the round down is at an angle, you generally need to go past the ship to get a clear picture of it. You can use your HSI as a reference when the heading to the boat is pointed 5 degrees behind your beam angle. The approach turn should utilize 27 to 30 degrees angle of bank and reference only your instruments. Do not peak until the 90. Now, just before you start your turn, you should increase power slightly so that you don't drop vertically when you start your turn. During this phase, I'm referencing four things. My AOA indexer for speed, my velocity vector and my VSI, my angle of bank and its proximity to the 30 degree marker, and my bearing relative to the BRC. At the start of this turn, you want to increase your vertical speed to roughly negative 200 to negative 300 on the VSI. When you hit the 135 mark, you want to increase your speed vertically to negative 300 to 400 on the BSI. At the 90, you want to be at about 500 feet AGL and you want to increase your vertical speed to negative 400 to 500. This is really important. Getting good at hitting this mark will really help you on the rest of the approach turn. At this point, you want to go ahead and take a peek and see where you are in relation to the ship. The sight picture takes time to learn, but after a few attempts, you'll start to understand that just with a glance, you whether you're going to under or overshoot. If you've hit all your marks and your vertical speed has been on point, when you cross the wake of the ship, you should hear your rad alt go off, and that should be about 370 feet AGL. Now, when you roll out wings level in the groove, You'll want to do a quick power off and power on to correct and maintain your on speed. You're going to want to uncage the HUD and the groove should be anywhere from 15 to 18 seconds from wings level to the deck. In the right conditions and the proper approach turn, your velocity vector should line up with the crotch of the ship. Sorry, wrong crotch. However, this does not mean you should rely on it. In fact, try not to pay attention to it at all. If you're using proper comms, you can call the ball at this point. The format is side number, aircraft type, ball, and your fuel state. For DCS, you probably do something like 069 Hornet Ball 3.0. 
Now, let's take a second to discuss the eye flaws, also referenced as the meatball or the ball. The eye flaws contains four main elements. The cut lights are used by the landing signal officer, also referred to as the LSO, to indicate a roger ball in scenarios where minimized radio transmission is required. Any subsequent illumination of the cut lights indicates add power. The wave off lights are controlled by the LSO to signal an immediate wave off. This could be due to a foul deck or an aircraft that is not within the safe approach parameters. The datum lights are green and they are located horizontally to the lens assembly with 10 lights on each side. The position of the ball in reference to the datum lights provides the pilot with glide slope information. If the ball is illuminated above or below the datum lights, the aircraft is high or low respectively. The lens assembly is a box that contains 12 vertical cells through which fiber optic light is projected. The upper cells are amber in color while the bottom two are red. The aircraft's position on the glide slope determines which cell is visible to the pilot. The visible cell compared to the horizontal green datum lights indicates the aircraft's relative position to the glide slope. If a red lens is visible, the aircraft is dangerously low. Now at this point, you want to just maintain an energized ball and stay lined up with the deck with no large power corrections. Something to keep in mind, at the top of the groove, one ball is 16 feet, and at the bottom, one ball is one foot making your margin of error much larger the closer you are to the deck. Once you're over the deck, just reference the ball all the way in. The landing should come as a surprise. As soon as you hear you've landed, increase power to mill and maintain for three seconds after you've stopped. This is in case you bolter or the cable snaps. You don't want to end up as shark food. Cut power to idle, lights off, wings up, and get the fuck out the way. Cause this is DCS, and there's probably someone already sticking their Geppetto tube where it doesn't belong. If you remember the LSO rules to live by and follow them, you should be fine. Never lead a low or slow. Always lead a high and fast. If low and slow, fix the low before the slow. If high and fast, fix the fast before the high. Never try to recenter a high ball in close, but try to stop a rising ball. Fly the ball all the way to touchdown, and the LSO is always right. Okay, lots of things just happened, and that was a lot to take in. I spent a lot of time working on my approaches, and a lot of time messing them up. Doing this right is really tough, so something to keep in mind during that frustration is that Navy pilots usually do about 340 of these on land before they even do it on the boat. So what I'm saying is don't expect to get this right, and don't rip on everybody else for not getting it right. Okay, maybe rip on them a little. It's all in good fun, right? To wrap things up, I wanna leave you with a few tips. Don't try and find the 100% sweet spot on the throttle. Not till you have things down. You're gonna to have to be stroking the throttle, but be gentle, it's sensitive. Like you in your early teens. The engines spool up a lot slower than what I was used to from other modules. So keeping on speed and not dropping out of the sky takes a lot of practice. You can practice touch and goes on an airfield doing the carrier brake pattern. Maycop is probably one of the best places for this because it's flat. Once you move to the boat, leave the hook up. Do a few practice touch and goes so you aren't constantly having to set things up over and over and over. Don't get frustrated. It is hard and there is no doubt about that. Take breaks. Sometimes I'd find I did one or two really good approaches and then for whatever reason I just fucked it up 10 times in a row. I would get upset, which only makes things worse. So just take breaks, especially when frustration sets in. All right, so hopefully this helped you guys figure out how to do case one recoveries and gives you some insight on how difficult it really is and how much stuff there is to pay attention to. Again, I just want to reiterate, it takes practice. It is hard. Do not expect to get this on the first try. I still suck at it most of the time. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. You can hit me up on my personal Discord or the Splash One Gaming Discord. Both can be found in the description below. Thank you guys for watching. Remember to hit that like and subscribe button, and I'll leave you guys with the full unpaused, uncut version of that landing. Enjoy.